All right, here we go. Hey, folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today on the show to discuss some really interesting developments last week in photography are uh, Mr. Brian Caparici. He's the guy behind the Sprouting Photographer and Sprout Studio, also African Wildlife. I don't know if I could, this this makes me feel weird to say this, Andy Biggs. African yeah. wildlife photographer Andy Biggs. Should that be, that should be like Andy Biggs. He's an African, or maybe he's a wildlife photographer who shoots in Africa. <laughs> How about just say nature photographer? There you go. <laughs> he's a nature photographer who frequents the continent of Africa yeah, from time yeah. to time. There you That's go. a good one. That's a good one. There you go. Hey, guys, well, welcome to the show. It's good to have both of you on. Thanks for having me back. Thanks to be. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it's good to have both of you guys. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Before we do that, I want to thank the first sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at Animoto. All right, guys, back to the news. Let's talk about this first story. The big news, obviously, other than Apple Watch, which if I see another Apple Watch post somewhere, I think I'm going <laughs> to run out screaming. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the big news for us in our crowd and our niche is the release of Lightroom 6, also known as Lightroom CC. So last week, Adobe released the, the next major update to Lightroom. The new version is available in two versions, 6, which is a standalone product, and CC for Creative Cloud subscribers. And I'm going to run down this bullet list of the features, and then I want to talk to you guys about what you think of it. So first of all, this new, this new version has facial recognition. It's got HDR merge, panoramic merge. It's got uh, kind of performance updates in the develop module. It's got filter brushes to allow you to paint on and remove uh, uh, adjustments from the graduated and radial filters. So, you know, you put one of those, those filters on the image. No longer are you locked into having it affect everything that's underneath that, that area. You can remove it from certain areas of that uh, of the affected area. Um, they've up, or made some enhancements to the slideshow module and some new features in the mobile app and a new Android version of Lightroom Mobile. So pricing on this, it's available for $149 and Lightroom CC, of course, you can you get it automatically as part of your subscription, um, which you can also get for uh, 10 bucks a month for the photography bundle. So Brian, I'm going to start with you on this. Wedding shooters, <laughs> arguably Lightroom is your bread and butter. It is your, it is your Batmobile to your Batman, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you spend a lot of time in this guy getting stuff done, work. So when they make a change to it, especially when it's significant as this, it affects you substantially, right? So tell me what you think. When you first saw the bullet list, before you even launched the app, were you like, okay, this is, this is features I've been waiting for, or did they miss the mark completely? Yes, I've been waiting for iPhoto-like facial recognition in my <laughs> professional editing application. I've been dying for that. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, yeah. So for me, when I first saw when I first saw like the notes on it on what was included in it, uh, I sort of skimmed through it and I was like, really? Like that's that's what we're getting? Like facial recognition and HDR merge in Lightroom? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking like, you know, what are you trying to be? Because HDR kind of goes more into the you know, semi-professional realm, whereas facial recognition I find to be incredibly useless for a professional photographer, at least in my space as a wedding and portrait photographer. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't see much use in that, but when I downloaded it and started sifting through it, I used it this, this past weekend uh, on my MacBook Pro at a wedding, and man, it's a lot faster. And I'll tell you that I definitely appreciate that um, under the hood improvement. Um, other than that, there isn't too much in it for me as a wedding and portrait shooter that's jumping out at me is something I've been longing for. Um, yeah. Yeah. I definitely I like the idea a lot of, of those, per those performance enhancements come from uh, them offloading a lot of the, the, the graphical tasks yeah. to, the, yeah. to the GPU instead of the CPU, which if you have a computer that has a compatible graphics processor in it and you check that box in preferences, you should see some pretty impressive speed gains, right? Yeah. I, and I definitely like how you can now go in and fine-tune the radial filters and those kinds of things as well. That definitely just, I mean, it's always been something that if you if you couldn't use just the out-of-the-box radial filter, you'd have to pull it into Photoshop to do some more advanced, uh, like, you know, uh, masking on it. But now that you can get in there and do some fine-tuning, I definitely like that. So that's an improvement. But for me, th those were the two main improvements, like as a wedding and portrait shooter. 
So, yeah, yeah, and you bring up a really good point. In fact, I've, I've scratched that down on my little uh, cheat sheet down here, and that's the idea of who who is Adobe targeting with this. Andy, I want to have you have you chime in now. First of all, when you saw the release, were you excited? Were you bummed? Did they miss things that you needed? That was a yawner, huh? Tell yeah, me, okay, like, why? Well, For the I mean, listening the, audience, Andy is uh, yawning, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just look at it and think, like, the time between different major rev, uh, yeah. revs of the software and we waited this long for that, and this is kind of like circa 2009, I guess. I don't know. You know, I, I, it's it's not that helpful. I think the the only thing that that applies to me that's helpful is the GPU offloading. It's a little bit faster. I have all of my um, personal photographs, all of my um, African wildlife photographs, and all of my kind of other photo trips, all in one huge catalog. And so that kind of helps me out quite a bit. Just it just everything just seems to be a little bit faster. Um, but really, overall, it's not that awesome. Um, with that being said, I've been I've been dabbling more in using Capture One. So what I've been doing is using Lightroom to to manage all of my photographs the, from the catalog, keywording, finding things. I do basic um, manipulations or, or or work on on photographs, and then I kind of I'm going into uh, Capture One for quite a bit these days. It supports layer type functionality. So, so the answer is <laughs> I'm not using Lightroom that much anyway. <laughs> Interesting. And you know, it's funny. Whenever we bring up Lightroom lately, especially in the context of you know the it being sort of the the safe haven for the aperture refugees, people are saying, well, yeah, I'm going to go check out Capture One too. So, you know, yeah. it seems it almost seems like we went from a from a two player race to a two player race. <laughs> you know, where. Yeah. That's you know, aperture's point. out of the mix, but Capture One arguably is is a is a stronger competitor to Lightroom because they're dual platform, and Aperture obviously was only on the Mac. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. And Brian cool. brought up a good point. Like, who is this for, Andy? So who is this? You know, looking looking at the the facial recognition features, which is very iPhoto like, which is ironic because iPhoto is gone now. <laughs> so it's very, <laughs> So yeah, very ironic. Like, and these those consumer type <laughs> features on the one hand, and then on the other hand, like Brian was saying, on the other hand, there's e there are these pro level HDR type features in there. Is Adobe trying to play towards both camps and try to make a kind of Rosetta Stone of of applications or what? Well, I'm going to beg the question: is, is the HDR and Panorama merge like functionality? Is that professional? Well, and so so that that's where I said professional-ish, because it's like at its yeah. core, it's a professional's feature, but it being in Lightroom makes it not really a professional feature, in my opinion. It's kind of like the HDR button on your iPhone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I'm probably the well, least Andy, qualified guy. Andy, you're leading. Function. You're leading the question, though, Andy. So <laughs> what what makes it not professional? I mean, I, you know, I understand on the, the facial recognition, it's very Facebook-like, right? But... Yeah. On the other side, with HDR and Panorama, are you saying pros don't use HDR, Andy Biggs? No, but I'm saying, well, first of all, let me, let me first say <laughs> that uh, it, has HDR jumped the shark already? I mean, yeah. you know, it's been around for a while, and I think we really started to see people adopting that type of uh, processing, you know, say 2006, 2007, kind of mm -hmm. came in its own a few years later. It's 2015, guys. You know, this is... We're, we're way past that. People who are doing HDR-like processing are really doing it in a more toned-down fashion, yeah. so you can't quite notice it very much. Very subtle. Um, you know, if I see another photograph of Ghost Town of Bodhi done in HDR, I'm going to barf. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, and I, I'm, but I'm also unpopular in that kind of world because on Twitter a couple years ago, I, I made a statement saying that HDR is like riding a scooter. It may be fun, but you don't want your friends seeing you doing it. <laughs> uh, but but you know, that, 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 but my my but my 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 um my argument is more that HDR, like other processing tricks, are often creative crutches that prevent people mm -hmm. from really making uh, uh good conceptualized photographs into final pieces, as opposed to taking a half baked idea and then using some trickery to make it look good. Yeah. And if you take yeah. that away, it's not that awesome to begin with. But some people need to rely on it quite a bit. Look at look at uh, real estate photographers. They really have to rely on it quite a bit. And Lightroom's going to solve that for them because it's yeah. exactly what they need, out of the box, fast, and easy to easy to use. No, I I, I totally agree with that. And but 
you know, I would backpedal on, you know, HDR having jumped the shark because I, you know, the I think the idea of the overprocessed, oversaturated, crispy, yeah. crunchy, you know, cartoonish HDR is, you know, I'm I'm with you. I'm gonna jump off a building if I see one more of those. Yeah. But, you but know, the toned but down ones, there's a good done. place for it. Yeah. Yeah, tastefully done. It's a tool, right? And you like you like you brought up the real estate photographers, those folks that that need to get an exposure yeah. of the outside with the with the lawn lights doing their thing, yeah. along with a balanced exposure of the inside lights at the same time. Those kinds of things means, you know, each, in other words, HDR is another tool in our tool belt that we pull out when necessary. Yeah. I don't think it's, you know, pushing it to the limit, it becomes an art form and a tick, you know. When, yeah. it, when it's not pushed to the limit, it's not an art form anymore. It's just a tool to, to visualize the scene ahead of you. Brian, what, what do you think about that? HDR, jump the shark, what? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's certainly a fad, and you still see. I mean, it sort of has has gone through the wedding and portrait space, and you still see a lot of surprisingly a lot of award-winning images that you see at like you know the PPA and WPPI, PPOC. They're still having that kind of really like over-processed look, and I'm sort of I look at them and I think like, wow, really? Like, are we not like are we not past that trend that that looks cool? Um, so I think it's unfortunate that it's still there. I think it is a crutch. I totally agree with Andy. Um, and, and that's where I sort of, that's I guess what, when I meant, when I said that it's a professional-ish feature, it's like it's a tool that professionals have used, but I feel like the way that Lightroom treats it, it makes it very consumer-ish. And that's again where I come back to the point where it's like, who is Lightroom trying to target with their application? Are they trying to come out and do that one-click HDR thing? Uh, like facial recognition, like what's the point of that? Panoramic merge. Would you not use Photoshop or a similar app for something like that? Yeah. Why are we trying to do all of those things in Lightroom? Like Lightroom was always meant to be this quick processing tool that we could get in, get out, catalog, keyword, and do your quick edits. It was never meant to be the full suite of everything, but it seems like they're trying to to push everything into it. And I just don't know if that's the right decision. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. It's a tough call, you know, and I feel for those guys because on the one hand you have to – you're, there's a pressure on the Lightroom team to keep innovating and to do cool stuff, even more so now that you know they're the safe haven for a lot of refugees from the Aperture Camp, right? So keep doing cool stuff and and make this this cool application. On the other hand, there's Capture One, like Andy brought up, and then also Apple Photos, which is you know it's like built-in success <laughs> for <laughs> Apple on the <clears throat> excuse me on the consumer side of things. So. You know what do you do? Do you do you build a light? You know you go down the road and build a Lightroom consumer edition and a pro edition. Do you try to merge them together and hope nobody notices the overlap, or or what do you do? I mean I don't know, Andy. From your perspective, looking at Lightroom, so you say you're playing around in Capture One now, but looking at Lightroom specifically, what's missing for you as the as Indiana Jones running, you know, ch being chased by boulders with your camera? <laughs> what's missing? <laughs> you know. Um... For me, I think better Lightroom mobile functionality, and not mm -hmm. so much tagging and keywording and sorting. I just want different presentation um, ideas, because right now we're just left with just one, op you know, one option for looking at your, your photographs. I like to see themes and, and other ways of looking at the same data, um, so that's a little bit easier for me to say, like, like if I'm sitting on an airplane and someone says, "What do you do for a living?" I can just give them my iPad, hand it over, and say, "Look for five minutes. Talk to me when you're done." <laughs> yeah, nice. you know, I mean, it just stops the conversation. But, but it's, I would like to see some more Lightroom mobile development. And this didn't really, this release didn't really seem to bring much forward. When you when you say mobile development in terms of uh, editing tools on the mobile side or synchronization, more robust synchronization, what? I would love better synchronization, but um, I just just better um, UI for what's already there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah, you can do a lot with UI, man. Just refine that instead of giving us new features, right? Brian, yeah. what about you? Uh, on the on the wedding side of things, what's missing for you? You know, we we know what you don't need. What do you need in the app? <laughs> okay, so first of all, I would love the ability to turn things off in Lightroom. You know, that way you don't you, you don't have to look at the things that you don't use, right? Yeah. Uh, and and per, perhaps even speed up the interface by doing that. But um, you know, all, all jokes aside, there's two things that I feel have been missing. Um, ever since, gosh, like the earliest versions of Lightroom that I feel are so simple. Number one, the ability to open up a Lightroom catalog over a network. Like that is so annoying that you can't do that because it yeah. basically restricts you to the machine and the hard drive that the Lightroom catalog is stored on. That's really frustrating and annoying. Yeah, that may be a limitation of SQLite, which is the back end of that. 
Yeah, so I mean, obviously yeah. there's going to be challenges with it, but but obviously at the same time there's been there's been plenty of softwares that have figured out how to do that properly with logging and you know taking over control of files if someone else has it open. However, the structure is um, there's got to be a way around that. But then also the ability to have more than one catalog open at a time. I would love for that to happen because like for me as a wedding photographer, if I'm done editing a wedding and I've got a thousand images that I have to export, as soon as I press the export button, I can't touch Lightroom until that finishes exporting. Yeah. That's really annoying when I want to move on to the next portrait session or the next wedding or go on and do something else. I have to leave that sitting there exporting. So I feel like those two features would be really nice to, to be able to have in there. And again, those are things where it's like refining what's already there as opposed to trying to stuff it with more things that aren't really all that useful. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with both of you guys. And I think... You know, look, looking at the app, you know, I wouldn't say that it's consumer, those features like the panorama, the, the HDR, and the, the facial recognition. I wouldn't say that those are, except for the facial recognition, yeah, that's consumer. But the other two are more consumer-ish, not, not straight consumer in there. And I wonder, you know, what, you know, I just, it's, it's interesting. I wonder what is next. And I, because on the other side, you know, we talked about the challenges before the Lightroom team about how to how to keep innovating with this with this platform and making it better without disrupting the existing user base and all that. But then on the other hand, you have to look at on their they have a a, a glass ceiling above them as well called Photoshop. I mean, you know, yeah. you can't cannibalize the cash cow of the company by yeah. introducing features. So no one has to use Photoshop until everybody is safely on the arc that is Creative Cloud. <laughs> you can't you can't cannibalize Photoshop at the same time. So you got to build cool features, not be consumer too much consumer, not too be too much pro. Don't take too many features from Photoshop so that people don't need to upgrade and use Photoshop. Okay, now within those constraints, Lightroom team, what can you build us to make people <laughs> compelled? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to counter that argument and saying that for $10 a month, when you get Creative Cloud, you get Lightroom and Photoshop together, actually, who cares? They're getting their 10 bucks a month, no matter right. which app you use, right? Right, unless you're not in the cloud yet. So like Lightroom, for example, yeah. you can buy Lightroom 6 separately. They haven't forced you into the cloud yet. So if you're, if you're a CC subscriber, you get it, and it's all good. You know, you're already you're, you're on the arc, so to say. I just, watched that, is I, I just watched that, that movie <laughs> Noah with Russell Crowe, so I'm thinking about Noah. <laughs> so you're on the arc, uh, but if you are not on the arc yet, and you are you just you buying it a la carte, Lightroom Six, then you know I'm I don't know I don't know Adobe's numbers, but I would assume that there's a large amount of revenue still left on the table of people that haven't pulled this trigger to move over to the cloud. So. I don't know. Yeah. It's scary. I mean, you know, and you think about if we're at six now, what's seven? What features can they put in seven? That was the impetus of my question around what's missing for you guys. So, you know, we're at six and it seems like, okay, that's all we got. You know, there's some, they're powerful and well-executed features, but you guys are like, uh, you know, that's all we got on the one hand. And when I ask you what's missing, you're like, uh, well, this this kind of stuff, you know? You know, it's, 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 it's hard, it's right? Product. But it's a mature product, right? I mean, it's yeah. a fairly mature product. I, I think, um, you know, I just got, I don't know, kind of jogged with some answers here. You know, I would like to be able to reorganize uh, in the develop module all the different tools on the right-hand side. I use a very non-standard approach of processing my photographs, which means I deal with all luminous-based controls before I deal with color controls, which means vibrance and saturation should be way down at the bottom and other things should be at the top. Yeah. And including the tone curve. And so I would love, like Brian said, I'd love to be able to turn some things off, get rid of them, and reorganize things. Yeah. yeah. Just an idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, you just making it more modular. And I've said this, and Brian, I want to have you chime in on that too, because I've said this about Photoshop many times on the show, and uh, to the fact that I would love... I would love for Photoshop to be more of a module-based system where mm -hmm. for X amount of dollars you get the spinal cord essentially, you know, and it does some basic functionality. And then depending on your chosen genre of photography, you add on to it. Like for wedding shooters, you'd buy, you know, you could buy these four modules to do these things. If you do a lot of video, you could buy a video timeline. If you find yourself doing 3D, you can add 3D on there, you know, and get that. But you wouldn't, all of those bits wouldn't be sitting dormant on your hard drive, <laughs> never, never right. to be used because everybody has to buy the same bucket of bits no matter what you're doing. 
you know? Yeah, I, I think that, that yeah. business model, I think, would, would get really confusing. I like the idea of a similar model, but just the ability, again, just to turn things off. So mm -hmm. you're not eating up space, you're not eating up processing power, you're not eating up resources that could otherwise be put towards other areas of the software. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think my brain is thinking more mobile, you know, like in-app purchases mm -hmm. where you're in Photoshop and you're like, oh, I have this job now and I'm supposed to be doing this thing. Oh, I got to go buy this add-on and Adobe gets a little chunk of revenue for that. But again, this is a world before Creative Cloud, I guess. <laughs> in the cloud, they just want you to get everything and forget about it. Everybody gets the same widgets, so they only have to update one thing. So, you know, I don't know. It makes sense. So what about mobile? So Andy, you brought up mobile, Lightroom Mobile. There's some powerful mobile apps out there. We talked about one in the last show, Snapseed, um, the free app from oh. Google. It's amazing, right? So looking at that, and, and I just, one of the TWIP listeners um, commented on that post, um, and I don't have the post up in front of me. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I'm going I'm to pull it up while we're talking about it. Um, but he, he clued me into an app called Enlight. I think it's Enlighten, Enlight. might be Enlight. Enlight. Have you guys seen this thing? No. You have? What is it? Is what it? Tell me about it. Oh my God! I mean, it is. Yeah, I don't want to overstate it, but <laughs> I'm searching right now. It's pretty dang cool. Okay, so it is a competitor to Snapseed. I would put it in the category of you know you got you have your Instagrams and your you know VSV you know all these different apps that do filter based type things on them. This app is up there with Snapseed in, term, in a category that I would like to call professional mobile apps. So these are the apps that you and I would use. These are the apps that have a tone curve in there. You know, they have histograms for, for people that know what a histogram is. You know, like Snapseed has layers, adjustment layers. I mean, they're, we're getting some advanced stuff now with these apps, with yeah. these apps now. And when I saw this Enlighten app, I was like, oh, man, this stuff is just crazy. <laughs> It's got healing in there, you know, just like Snapseed. It will do content-aware fill, all this stuff, in the palm of your hand. I'm thinking, okay, how far, how soon until I have a, f I don't need any Photoshop, Lightroom, none of that stuff. I can do everything from one of these small, scrappy players that charge $5 for their app, one-time fee, and I got it, you know, and I get most of what I need done on my iPad, you know, or the rumored iPad Plus, whatever that's going to be, you know, I can get most of my work done there. Wouldn't that wouldn't that be cool? I don't know, Brian. Would you? I mean, what do you think? Have you seen Enlighten? Uh, I I mean, I ha I've heard of it actually. It was it was mentioned on another podcast that I listened to, and I I checked it out then, and I just pulled it up right now to take a look. And I mean, yeah, it looks cool, right? I mean, it's it's got that cool, that sexy factor. It's mobile. It's new. It's trendy. It's like, uh, but I just for me, I keep coming back to thinking of. In terms of use case, would that be cool for like the Instagrammer or or the photographer that wants to do one-off stuff? Yeah, yeah, I think that's well. No, no, no. I think I think it'd be interesting. But I'm thinking for me as a wedding shooter, am I going to use something like that to process a thousand photos? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. It's the one-off. You know, I said no because I don't think it's for I don't think it's for the consumer like amateur no, 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 photographer. No. It's more of a these are more of pro tools. They you know they have a they have one foot in the pro court. Like they speak to me when I look at them. I'm like okay. I understand this. I could, I could, I could get down with this app. But but see, I, I, I wonder. I, I have to be left to wonder how much of it is because it's new, cool, and in a new format, and it's sort of got that sexy factor to us tech photo nerds yeah. as much as like the actual use case of it. Like, okay, after you get over the newness of it, would you still love it as much as when it was new? Yeah. Um, and 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 that's sort of where I where I come at it from. Like for me. I almost don't want photography to be treated as this mobile throwaway thing that I can just click a bunch of buttons on my iPhone and make this, you know, pretty HDRs looking image. Like I, 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 I want to get it on my computer. I want to get it on a beautiful 27 inch screen. I want to open it up in Lightroom. I want to do my work on the image like I do as a professional. And so yeah. I, I actually kind of in a way sort of resist that mobile movement because just for me, I want to treat it with the art that I, I treat it with when I use it on my desktop machine. So I don't think you can replicate that on a mobile app. That's, uh, that's interesting. That's a whole different line of questioning because there are people <laughs> that have built entire businesses totally. making, been, you know, yeah. gazillions of dollars on Instagram alone. Yep. Andy, yep. what about you? Mobile, you know, you, uh, let, me, let me phrase the question differently. Mobile, and this Enlighten app, and apps of its ilk. Do Which they, I can't find, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll send it to you. Uh, does it have a uh, a place in your world, especially in your you know your workshop world when you're when you're doing your tours and that sort of thing? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to me, there's there's um, there's just a difference between uh, you know real photographs and photographs that are great for Instagram, just quick like what am I up to? What am I up to? Behind the scenes kinds of shots, and that's when stuff like Snapseed just pops in and it works well for that. I'm not going to take my quote unquote real photographs or so the things that I'm very serious about. I'm not going to do anything mobile with it, just like Brian said. But I am going to, you know, need to do a little bit of work, like uh, cropping, a little bit of saturation adjustments, and things like that. Um, and I use Snapseed Mobile for that. It's such a great tool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is beautiful. I'm sharing, I'm sharing the screen now. Tell me if you can see this. Oh, ah, yeah. Yeah, this is it. And take note of that URL, Andy, if you need to. <laughs> So Sorry. thank you. Yeah, so this is it. And I'm just a fan of the way that they uh, you know, they approach the mobile interface. You know, that that kind of got me. And Brian, when you're you know, I your point's taken, you know, I'm I'm the same person. I like to sit down at my my big display in my office with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and kick back and you know, it's fun. It's a it's a editing, you know, cathartic process of sitting here rather than doing it on your thumb while you're stuck in traffic or something. But I still think that these kinds of apps represent not the future, but a future, you know, a fragment of the future of photography. There are many people that are cons going to consume your work this way, you know, even on the wedding side, right? They're going to consume totally, your work yeah. only on mobile. <laughs> you know? For sure. And, and, and that's why it's like I, I don't... I don't make those statements from the point of, you know, the film photographers, you know, back when digital was first coming, saying that I resist the change. But I think more for me, when, when I look at what's exciting for me or what's new and exciting that I think for me as a photographer that, that holds more merit is, like, on my Fuji camera, I can really fine-tune the JPEG settings on it, shoot a beautiful JPEG in camera. If I'm really focusing on being a great photographer, focusing on light, focusing on composition and posing, all those things, and then I can wirelessly transfer that to my phone and post it as is. I personally get more excited about that and really honing my photography than I do about going more snapshotty and throwing filters on it. Uh, yeah. But again, that's just me, and, and, and perhaps that's more me as a purist photographer because I certainly have that approach in my photography where I don't want to have editing visible. So that yeah, I, could be I a hear personal you. preference. I, I feel like there's, 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 for me, you know, personal preference-wise, there's, there's two... There's, there's multiple sides to me, but you know, there's two main photographic sides, and there's going to be, you know, the mobile side. Maybe there's three. There's the mobile side, and that's me when I'm out and about with my iPhone. I'm taking pictures. I'm playing with it, and I share it online. You know, I may do some coffee or a latte that I saw, and I'll take a picture of that and adjust it and put it on Instagram. You know, that kind of stuff. That's kind of like junk food photography in my in my mind. But then there's the next level, which is more serious photography where I'll take out one of my quote real cameras and play around do some long exposures and you know do some stuff like that that I'll bring back and either put on the main computer or Wi-Fi them over from the camera to the mobile device edit them and post them there and then the third level is pro stuff I'm not gonna do any mobile stuff there but that's, you know, you go out and shoot, you bring it home, you edit, you post the gallery, you send the client credentials to look at the gallery, you bill them, that's it. You know, so, there's, so on, the, on the far left side of that, the consumer-y side of me is, the, you know, everything's fine. That would be the photos, you know, Apple Photos type world where I can shoot and it's going to go in there, it's going to go up on Google+, Plus you know, I don't, it's all good. But on the far right, I want my tool to be Lightroom or Capture One or whatever it is to be robust and let me get in there and tweak and move pixels and all that stuff. Andy, what's your what are what are your worlds? I mean, you mentioned you got one library with all that stuff in there. Hopefully, it's backed mm -hmm. up. <laughs> but, dude, but, dude, I've got more Synology boxes that you can shake a stick at. <laughs> good man. <laughs> good oh, yeah. man. You know, my world is. Um, I'm always dabbling in new technology. I, I, as a workshop leader, I have to be up to up to speed on you know not only Canon, Nikon, Sony, Phase One, Valsablad, all the different camera manu uh, manufacturer stuff, but also the technology to process them. So I have um, half a foot in Lightroom, half a foot in Capture One. Um, I shoot with a Fuji X-T1 for kind of non-serious stuff. I'm chasing around my kids with this thing. <laughs> um, I have all the primes and all the zooms and everything. 
And this is actually what I took to um, Antarctica and South Georgia a few months ago. I mean, ironically, I took the two smallest cameras I could find. But anyway, and, and um, so I use Lightroom quite a bit. I'm trying to figure out a way to answer this question without taking 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> you oh, know, like I, I did? <laughs> yeah, well, but I also use this all the time. I'm, I'm a big Instagram guy now. In the last year, I've, I've really jumped on board and started having fun with that, just a little behind-the-scenes kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I take a lot of photographs with an iPhone 6 Plus, a lot. Yeah. Um, so I use Snapseed quite a bit, and I, I have to rely on Dropbox to move files around between mobile and desktop. And, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of adopt it all, but I just recognize that they all have different purposes and different audiences. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. Oh, Brian, Brian, you mentioned that you – did I hear this correctly, that you do most of your work in Lightroom and you're not – like yeah. you don't have the, the the multiple personality disorder that I have, right? So you're <laughs> you're much more focused and I'm have everything in Lightroom. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I don't have to open Photoshop up, then I won't open it up. <laughs> so yeah. I'm I'm mostly just in Lightroom. <laughs> um, and then and then even if that if not that, I try and do as much as I can. Like I shoot raw and JPEG for my weddings and portraits, and so if I don't have to bring images into Lightroom, I won't. So I'll just take the JPEGs out of the camera for me. Wow, that see that's. That's interesting. So you know, I, I the, the interesting. I'll close this this section off with this idea, and that's just that, you know, it, we're in the eye of the storm right now. You know, with regard or somewhere in the storm with regard to all these different options that we have out there. The cameras are coming out a mile a minute with new capabilities, and you know, we've got cloud services, desktop software, phones, watches, all the stuff that can display our images. Um, and the one piece of it, like Andy, you, you mentioned you've got, you know, uh, an army of Synologies over there. The one piece that's missing, it's that piece. I mean, not so much the backup, not so much which tool do you use, not so much what's your mobile strategy, but wouldn't it be great if there was just one thing <laughs> that you could just use that did everything correctly and that just served, you know, like an operating system for photographers or something? I don't know. So it just feels like we're whoever you know. I've talked to hundreds of photographers, and everyone has a different way of doing things. You know, even within the same genre, you know, different way of doing things, different backup methodologies. I hate Drobo. I love Drobo. I hate Synology. I love Synology. I don't trust any of them. I put it all on Crash Plan, or I don't even have a backup strategy. It's you know. <laughs> oh God. Oh stress, stress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm with you, though. I'm with you, though. These are first world problems, as they say, but still, I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, we're getting Adobe. I'm calling you out. I mean, we're getting facial recognition when clearly, like Brian was saying, wouldn't it be great to be able to open a catalog or multiple catalogs or, you know, open one on the network? You know, I know it's easier said than done, armchair yeah. quarterbacking, but still, you know, as a consumer... I've heard I've been hearing this for years too. People want to have multiple users be able to access one centralized library. And yeah. Adobe arguably has solved this already with their, you know, Photoshop has had that check in, check out thing forever for designers, you know. You know like, what? Like, yeah, like, let, let's take another example. Um, we're talking about the catalog some more. You yeah. know, I can't tell you how often I, I get the question of, hey, Andy, I'm on a trip. Do I create a new catalog for the trip, and how do I merge it with my one back home, and how does that, oh, yeah. how do I do, I mean, the, I've been hearing this since 2006 when we were running a beta software, you know, mm -hmm. um, when it was Shadowland, when we were all part of the beta group back then. I remember that, yes. Yeah, yeah and um, I guess I tip my hat a little bit too much here, but. Um, <laughs> Wait, rewind that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rewind. Yeah, it's <laughs> No, but it, but it's it, to me that's a pretty basic thing, and if you could just automate that a little bit easier, even though the the core functionality doesn't change, make a better UI that somehow manages it all. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really that's I don't it. think it's rocket science. User I don't think it's rocket science. science. Yeah. We were all born too early. That's the problem, you know. In the year 2020, all of this will be sorted, and we won't care anymore. <laughs> So, well, you know, Brian will care. I'm sorry. Brian will still care. <laughs> but anyway. You know, you know. It, it, speaking of being born too early, maybe, maybe so. You know, look at like I remember going on long trips with with film, sitting in an igloo, and now, like I, a, a couple months ago, I went on a long trip with 200 something gigs of compact flashcards, and I I took an iPad Mini. I didn't even download. I I I got. I made it to happy hour faster, right? I mean, you know, yeah. I, I went shooting and I I got home after a long trip, and then I downloaded. 
Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, you know, like I just didn't even think about it. I didn't really yeah. care. Yeah, it's it's getting to that level. Yeah. That's cool. I don't know. All right, before we leave the section, um, I want to actually, you know what, before we move on, I want to thank our very first, actually this is the first episode of this new sponsor that we're adding to the sponsorship lineup for This Week in Photo, and that's our friends over at Panasonic. So Panasonic Lumix is joining the advertiser lineup for This Week in Photo. I'd like to thank them for coming on. All right, guys, let's jump into story number two. So this is, this is we're not going to spend much time on this, but this is interesting. We, we don't like to talk about, like, you know, to put on the, the old Apple hat, unreleased products or services or anything like that. But this one was interesting. So Apple uh, recently acquired an Israeli startup called Lynx, L-I-N-X, um, Lynx Computational Imaging. They spent $20 million for this company, um, and you don't, I mean, I guess Apple has $20 million, you know, in the couch cushions. But that's, a, that's a rounding error, dude. It's a rounding error for them, you know. That's Phil Schiller's, you know, <laughs> quarterly salary. But, you know, looking at this, you don't, all joking aside, you don't spend $20 million unless you're serious about something. So what does Lynx Computational Imaging do? So they developed a very small multi-aperture imaging technology that combines special, I'm reading this now, by the way, special purpose <laughs> sensors, optics, Marketing and image payment. processing. I have not memorized this. <laughs> so, so basically they say this approach brings two kinds of benefits to the smartphone and tablet photographers. First, better quality, and the second is a long list of cool features that you wouldn't be able to do today. For example, um, image quality that can match a DSLR, but with a small, tiny smartphone. Um, a depth map that can improve the quality of, and speed of autofocus. The ability to change focus after the photograph has been taken, a la Lytro. Um, mm -hmm. The ability to remove backgrounds from stills or video, dot, 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 in real time. Uh, faster facial recognition, that's Brian's feature, and then also <laughs> improved, performance, <laughs> improved performance for low light. So, you know, looking at this in this acquisition, we can kind of see if you extrapolate that, hey, maybe one or two of these features might find their way into the iPhone 7 or 8. Brian, when you, when you saw this and you read this article, is this, what, what did this make you think? Were you, as a wedding shooter, wedding and portrait shooter, were you like, okay, finally I can ditch my Fuji, <laughs> I can just use my phone for everything, or what? Well, hey, I mean, if my iPhone could take the same pictures as my DSLR, why do I need a DSLR, right? That's right. At yeah. least that's according to their marketing uh, verbiage. <laughs> um, no, okay, so I, I, I think, like, again, like you, you sort of know my stance on the on the mobile thing. Like, I don't do a lot of, you know, iPhoneography type stuff. I like to shoot with my Fuji. I've got the X100T, which is super portable, and I like the flexibility and the function that I have with that camera. But um, I, I'm also not naive enough to think that this is some pretty cool technology that's coming out. I love the innovation that this brings to our industry. And and I say that in a couple ways. Number one, I think that it it, it uh, enables a lot a lot more consumers with some great technology and some great capabilities. Um mm -hmm. but I, but I also am left to wonder like with this kind of technology, this is a pretty big paradigm shift in in how photos are taken at least in the smartphone realm. And I'm left to wonder what what could this eventually mean for professional grade, you know, lenses and cameras like could this kind of technology work its way up um, or does this mean that we got to fight harder does this mean that we have to be more creative like, does it, like w what does this mean to us as professionals no matter what that ends up being I think that it just pushes the industry forward so I think it's pretty exciting yeah I agree with you and 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 you want to have you chime in on this I where I personally stand on this is that the wave we've been hearing these rumblings of computational photography for ages and you know, the Samsung Galaxy X6 has kind of, you know, broken the the veil of being able to change the background later within the phone and all that stuff. So in Lytro with their focus later mm -hmm. uh, technology, all these things have been there and they're coming. And as processors get faster and mirrorless cameras get more and more adoption, this kind of software can easily move into a mirrorless camera and you'll be able to do this cool stuff <laughs> yep. with, a, with a, quote, professional camera. Andy... What about you? I mean, in your world, you're you're always on the leading edge, right? You're like you said, you're looking at the latest and greatest cameras that are out there because you have to be, is because the people yeah. on your workshops have them. So yeah. when someone shows up with an iPhone 7 Plus 
that does all this stuff that I read off in that list. Are you going to be ready for it? I think it's cool. I mean, I have to ask the question, are they buying the, – I think they may be buying the people, maybe not the technology. They may be buying the, the, the people and their ability to solve problems, yeah. or they're buying the technology to, to put in some sort of intellectual property bucket and just kind of hold it on the side. It may not end up d developing it. They may have just got the people. You know, a lot, of, a, lot of these, a lot of these acquisitions in Silicon Valley these days are driven by buying talent. And $20 million is pretty cheap, to be honest with you. you know? It is. It is. Yeah, and I kind of look at it as, yeah, you know, is, it, is that really going to work? I, th I'm, I seem to be more intrigued by the hardware side than the, than the software side of what, this, what the I solution agree. is, which yep. is, you know, multi-lens multi devices sitting on iPhones, and each lens does something differently, and then together they all have strengths and weaknesses that they all piggyback on, right? So you mm -hmm. might have one lens that shoots low light, one lens that shoots... Uh, you know, more ample light, one that shoots, you know, a zoom, one's more of a wide angle, and you, you can basically stitch them together with multiple shots. And there are other companies doing that, by the way. And um, so I'll, I'm going to hold yeah. back on that one. Yeah, because there's a lot more going on in that space. I just think that right now it's, it's a buying of intellectual property and talent, not necessarily going to market with product. And that's typical of, of tech companies, right? Buying, buying the intellectual property not so much the not so much the stuff that you made before, but you that was a that was the rite of passage into us paying writing this check for you to come into our company. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I did my Silicon Valley time, and this was this is typical this is typical corporate uh, <laughs> corporate buying of talent. You know, I mean, yeah. that's that's kind of way I view it. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's, it's all very interesting, and the the whole computational sp space is. You know, it's just a whole nother thing. And you start, my brain starts exploding when I think of like, okay, we've got all this computational stuff. Like even, you look at Olympus, the Doug Kay and Gordon Lang on the latest All About the Gear, they were talking about the, uh, the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II and how it's a 16 megapixel micro four third sensor in there, but, and it's image stabilized. Mm -hmm. And the programmers found a way to control the image, the sensor, so they to get a 40 megapixel shot out of there, they can shift it around over the course of a second to squeeze more out of that. So we're getting that fine level control at the sensor level. And then with technologies like this, we're messing with the optics and then, you know, the computational removing backgrounds and all this stuff. It makes me, it makes my head explode because I think about all the stuff that we can do and then the stuff that's coming, the phones, and then you lay that layer all that over with drones, like what DJI is doing with the yeah. Inspire. You know, it's just it just gets crazier and crazier. You know, it's just some some cool stuff in just a couple of years is going to be here. Notwithstanding all this stuff with these these really cool mobile apps that we're seeing, so it's a it's a bright future for photographers. But Brian Caparici, I feel like you're going to take the you're going to take the position of the curmudgeon on Twip. <laughs> like you're gonna be you're gonna be the John C. Dvorak of this week in photo. Oh, nobody goes, nobody rises to that level. Come on. <laughs> you're like it all sucks. Nobody wants that crap. <laughs> well, I I, th I think I mean you know the thing is you're always gonna have. Again, it was like the the film the digital revel like the the change there. It's like you're gonna have those the purists that say you're not gonna get the same quality, you're not gonna get this. You can't like well, what happens when you print it this big? Like back when you had two megapixel images, like you know what what were you gonna do with that? But technology goes and it changes, and I think that uh, you know that there and it's an amazing book for anyone that sort of feels that kind of resistance because as much as I sit here and say that. You know, I, I like what I do right now. Um, I'm certainly not against change either. Great book that I recommend reading if anyone feels that way. Um, it's called Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer <laughs> Johnson. And it's, like it's a great about. little fable-based business book about the importance of adapting to change in business and, uh, and in society. And it's, it's a really great, really quick, short read. And it just, the, the whole message is like you, you, can't, you can't stay you know, still, you have to continually move, you have to continually adapt, especially in an industry that we're in with technology. I mean, my gosh, like, what we do now in six months, or, or the changes that we see now in six months were the changes that we used to see in, like, 20 years. Like, it's yeah. crazy what's happening with technology. Yeah. So, you have to stay nimble, and you have to stay on top of things. Yeah, it's scary. I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to read that book. Hopefully it's on Kindle. But, the, <laughs> speaking of being on the bleeding edge, um, but you think about that stuff, and I think, like, 
as this the pace of innovation and releases and all this stuff increases, because it's not going to slow down, right? It's just going to keep going and going. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, I'm going to give up. <laughs> you know, at some point, at some point, I'm just gonna say, okay, I give up. I'm gonna the stuff that I have today is what I'm gonna continue to use. You guys, you guys, go on without me. I'm gonna stay yeah. on this cul-de-sac over here and have fun making images. But when do we get there? I mean, I'm nowhere close to that right now because I still I still have daily gear lust. But I can feel the pangs of it coming. I can feel the pangs of, you know, in case in point, the Apple Watch release. You know, the old awesome. Frederick would have had one today. You know, the new Frederick is like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna mosey on into June and see what what the reports are like, you know, before I get one. Okay, uh, John Dvorak. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. Andy, did you order one? Did you order your watch? Nope. I'm a mechanical watch guy. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Brian. Yeah, no, I just I'm I'm waiting to see what it's like. Actually, one of the guys in the office got one. That I think it's gonna be coming in on Wednesday. So I'll be I'll be lusting over it when I see it, and I'll probably at that point go and make the purchase. <laughs> you're destroyed. Well, I don't think it's gonna be that easy. <laughs> no, I don't. Th I think you're right. Yeah. So it's gonna. It's force not me an to impulse wait. buy kind of it, thing. No, it'll force me to wait. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Let's move on with the show. Uh, geez, time flies so fast. Um, before we jump into our listener q and I want to thank our final, last but not least, sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that is our fine friends over at FreshBooks.com. All right, guys, let's jump into the listener Q&A, and this week's question is from Tim Duvall. He says... I've been shooting as a hobbyist for a year or so, but have been picking up paid work lately doing portraits, music videos, and filming acoustic studio sessions. It's gotten to the point where I need to set up a, prof a professional site and email to handle the business and get new clients. Can you guys talk about opinions, or options rather, uh, and pros and cons for hosting? I've looked into Squarespace, Zenfolio, and a few others, but I would like to hear some in-depth comparisons and other options based on your experiences. So hosting, mm -hmm. hosting for photographers. Mm -hmm. so, Andy, what about you? I mean, who are you using for your hosting? And I'm assuming he's talking about I mean, is he talking? Yeah, and Tim, I would have to ask you to to elaborate here. You mentioned Squarespace and Zenfolio. Zenfolio is not going to build your entire website. It's more of a gallery heavy thing. Um, Squarespace, you can build anything you want in it, including e-commerce and all that stuff. Andy, what do you, what do you think? I'm I'm a Squarespace customer on my blog, but I haven't upgraded to the latest version. I'm about to do that, but I don't have e-commerce enabled on that. I think if in my experience, if you're going to build a good-looking website with e-commerce out of the box, make delivery of photographs, whether purchases of prints or, or, or files, I think SmugMug is probably your best bet right now. You know, yeah. such, a, such an easy solution in that space. I think Squarespace will do a lot more for you, but it doesn't seem like he's going towards that. I think Squarespace is a better content management system. To, to do a lot more with, you know, have multiple users posting different things, write a blog, multiple blogs, link them all together, and do e-commerce and some galleries. But I think it sounds to me like he's really more driven around having galleries with e-commerce rather than having a, a full content management system like Squarespace. So I'd recommend SmugMug. SmugMug. One, one point for SmugMug. Brian Cabarici, what about you? What do you uh -huh. think? So you know this is going to come with a personal, uh, a personal <laughs> sort of. Wait a minute here. Okay, so so a couple of thoughts. I, again, I I would definitely want. Um, was it Tim? Sorry, Tim was his name. Yeah, Tim. Tim. So Duval. I definitely would, would want him to, I guess, clarify because hosting really is like hosting at its core is just well, where do you put something? Um, he mentioned website. He mentioned Squarespace and Folio. It sounds like you know he wants to get into the promotion side of his business. So how how do how can he have a portfolio? How can he collect inquiries? Um, how can he show his about page? How can he, you know, integrate social media, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting the sense that he wants more like his portfolio website. So um, if that's the case, uh, Tim, what I personally would suggest, and again, this is coming from someone that personally has a lot of passion in the business space of running a photography business. That's what that's what I teach and that's what I do. Um, I would consider hiring a web developer for this. Um, and I know that that comes with a lot of weight uh, in the sense of, gosh, what a process, right? I mean, to, hire, to hire a web developer and go through it, it's going to be expensive. You're talking custom work. Um, yeah, but you know what? Um, 
people sort of cringe at the fact that how much we charge as professional photographers too. Right. And yeah. I say this all the time to wedding and portrait shooters that are asking me like, oh, you know, I want a, I want a better website. What, what template should I go with? And I say, well, how do you feel when your clients come to you and say, I want better portraits? Can you do what Walmart does? You know. And it's not, not to say that all of the template sites are, are the Walmart. It's just they are templates. And so there's going to be only so much flexibility you can do with it. If yep. you want to go template based or more in that realm, my personal recommendation would be one of two. One would be Photocrati, which is a WordPress theme. Um, mm -hmm. I personally like WordPress. That's always been my platform of choice. Um, mm -hmm. And my next one, would, which would also be WordPress based, would be Pro Photo Templates. Oh, I so haven't heard of either one of those. Cool. Those two are, are, in my opinion, the best in the industry as far as uh, a template is, is concerned. Um, both of them offer a fair amount of flexibility and customization once you get in and under the hood. But still, my ultimate suggestion would be that if you want to be running a sustainable business, and that's what I always talk about with regards to the business of photography, you, you know, you, you can't go out of the box. You can't go canned. You have to get into developing something that's unique and specialized and, and designed specifically for you, for your needs, for your brand, for who you are, how you want that presented to the world, and you can only do that with a custom website. So that would be my first recommendation, and if you can't quite get there financially or commitment-wise, go down and go with either Photocrati or Profoto templates. Love it. Love it. And I would add on to that. I, I agree with both, both of you guys on that, but I would add on that um, Tim mentioned in his email or his message that he said, I want to set up, I need to set up a professional site and email to handle business and get new clients. So going off of that, the email piece of that, you're going to need to register your domain and maybe get your email set up through them oh, or right, use, yeah. use Google, Google Apps. Apps. Google yeah, Apps. that's what I've been using mm. for the better part of a decade. Is, yeah. uh, is Google Apps and FrederickVan.com goes through there, Twip, all that stuff, and yep. it's it's worked for me. I've you know I was at a meeting uh, a couple days ago, and some folks were saying, "Oh, you use Google for your mail? Aren't you worried about their sniffing in there?" I'm like, you know, <laughs> no, not really. I'm not, you know, I'm not trading state secrets through my email or anything. If they need, you know if they need to look yeah. in there, they can look in there. But that's the first thing, you know, in the domain. Um, a uh, a friend of the This Week in Photo family is Hover. They're not currently an advertiser, but Hover.com is a good place to register your domain at, and I think they still have the offer code TWIP up there, so you can, you know, I think it'll knock like 10% off of a domain registration, but you can do that. And then for his business side, depending, Tim, depending on if you're leaning more towards like what Andy was saying of having your galleries, gallery of site, you know, of images, and you want to enable paid galleries in there that you're selling images and all that stuff, I would recommend SmugMug for that. You know, definitely yeah. go to SmugMug all the way. But if you're looking for more of a business site where you're going to have a full-on blog going and maybe you want to have a store later on mm -hmm. and you want some other stuff, then Squarespace is the way to go. Um, I'm a WordPress fan too, Brian. Um, but I, for new people, and it sounds like Tim is relatively new, I would steer them away from WordPress right now because... Uh, you know, right now I feel like I'm really good or relatively good. I know where my boundaries are at least inside of WordPress, but it's been a journey to get there, you know, and yeah. it's it's not easy and it takes a lot to stay on top of WordPress, updating your plugins and, yeah. you know, it's very complex. So to that end, if you want to go, Tim, if you want to go the WordPress route and you don't want to go Squarespace, Brian, don't you do consultations where you would you would help him <laughs> in WordPress? Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, well, contact the sproutingphotographer.com and he can at least direct you into the right place. To go. <laughs> one million dollars <laughs> for one million dollars. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's a. I don't know if we answered it, but you know, give us some more information in the in the comments for this this post, and we'll uh, see if we can't get you more data. But yeah, yeah, if you're doing email, definitely setting up a website is not going to set up your email. So, <laughs> so don't be going down that route. Right. All right, folks, uh, listeners, if you have a question you want us to tackle in the show, just visit thisweekinphoto.com and click on the Submit a Question link, and you can send us a text question or or send us a voice message. All right, guys, let's move on to the picks of the week. This is a segment where you guys can pick anything to recommend to the TWIP army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Andy, you haven't been on it since, jeez, I think Clinton was in office last time you were on. Oh, jeez. Well, I haven't gotten the invitation. How about that? Oh, here we go. Here we go. No. Hey, okay. you don't need an invitation. Just show up. 
So what, yeah. what's your pick of the week, Andy? Oh, man. The new DJI Phantom 3. Oh. Uh, the pro- dude, the professional version. So let me just say this. It's Monday, and in two days ago, I flew my first drone ever. Okay, yeah, I'm a lame. I'm totally lame. But my okay. friend Eric Chang, who's the general manager um, of DJI here in the States, he, he was in town, and we just went flying around for a while, and I was blown away at how mature the technology is now, both from a, the actual um, multi-rotor device, the controlling of the device, the remote, but also through the gimbal and the video, everything is mature, and it's out of the box. It works wonderfully. It's, it's absolutely yeah. amazing. And, you know, am I going to use it for wildlife? No. No, I, I'm not into annoying wildlife, but it's great for doing establishing shots and B-roll as well as still shots of just about anything. You know, yeah. I, I could envision doing a group shot on one of my trips just from a from a drone up in the air. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, anyway, that's my pick of the week. I'm buying one. I'm buying one, too. I've been waiting on this. I was waiting on, you know, they, they released that Inspire, which was like three grand, um, way outside of my budget. Then this one came out, and they've got... The the what is there's two versions right one shoots 4K and one does it and right. uh, one's a thousand yeah. bucks the other one's 1349 I think whatever yes yeah, 13 yeah it's I think a 4K I'm gonna get the version one. I gotta get 4K. the 4K one but yeah a friend of mine I was just down in Santa Barbara this weekend um, and Pete Giordano who is oh, the yeah. yeah Pete is one of the guys behind the Arcanum over there with Trey Radcliffe yeah. he brought his his uh, Phantom 2 Vision Plus out and flew it on the beach. We were having like a, a reception meeting on the beach and boom, he launched this thing out, went out over the Pacific and shot back at the house and it was just yeah effortless. That was my sales. I mean, Eric doesn't need to do anything because I like, just let people show other people and they'll become customers. <laughs> Jeez, man. Yeah, it's, it's so, such a mature technology. It's cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, I'm right on there. I'm right with you, man. I'm going to order mine. They're not shipping yet. You can order them, but you can't. They won't ship until, what, a couple weeks or so? I don't so, know. I just want one for my California trip coming up with a family early June. That's all I want. That's, that's that it. that Phantom is where my Apple Watch money went. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, inter- that's an interesting choice. It's an interesting choice. Yeah, Good choice. Right. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. All right. Well, cool. All right. That's a perfect pick of the week. I agree with that pick of the week. Mm. Uh, Brian Cabarici, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is so boring in comparison to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a multi-rotor. <laughs> watch <laughs> oh man, I uh, I fold and give my pick of the week to Andy. No, <laughs> <laughs> no you can't fold. Uh-uh. <laughs> okay, so so this is something. It's uh, I I've been using it for a while now, but I I just got another one because I moved offices and I now need a second for at home. And I love this thing. It's the the Lexar Professional Workflow. So it's the the USB 3.0 four hub uh, card reader. Cool. So you basically can buy different modules, and it's all modular. So you buy whichever kind of card you want to have, and you can have different combinations of them. So for me, I shoot mostly Fuji and a little bit of Nikon. So I have three SD card slots and one compact flash card slot in it, mm-hmm. and it's USB 3.0. So it's super quick. It plugs them all into one USB port, and it lets me import four cards at a time. So as a wedding shooter, I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, I used to have the, I think it was Lexar that made it. It was the the Firewire 800 version of it, but it was just for compact flash. So when I needed the SD cards, I needed a better solution. Um, And gosh, I love this thing. It goes so quick. The fact that I can import four at a time is incredible. And it's portable, so uh, and, and and it's modular, so you can build it to suit. There you go. It's just like what Frederick wants in Lightroom. It's like or Photoshop. It's modular, but it's the card reader version of modular. So I love it. What's yeah. the, how much is this thing going to set me back? Um, the actual main units, like I think a hundred and two, uh, two hundred bucks, and then each of the each of the guys that go in it are thirty bucks. So to get fully outfitted, you're like three hundred bucks. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Cool. See, I always get all these cool tips. On the show, cool, cool things to spend my money on. So I got to buy that. <laughs> I was already buying that Phantom, Andy. So you're not getting credit for that. But what's your chip? What's your pick? My pick. I already had this as a pick. It, it may sound like cheating, but the software that we mentioned earlier in the show called Inlight, E N L I G H T. It's five bucks, which is cheaper than both of your picks of the week. <laughs> but it is cool. It's an iPhone app. Play with it. Go to their website. Their webs- We'll put the, a link to the website in the uh, the notes for this episode, but it's just Inlight app. 
Facebook.com. They've got a little video demo up there of what it can do. You know, I was just laying on the couch yesterday playing with photos that I shot in Santa Barbara, and I was just, like, giggling at how cool it was. And I, I, was, I had the same kind of giggling experience that I had with Snapseed of, like, yeah. wow, I can do this. I'm, I'm I really remember... curious to hear, what, what does Frederick giggling sound like? <laughs> Yeah, uh, exactly. Like like, the entire world doesn't know that, but <laughs> no. But I'm thinking, you know, I was looking at it, and I was remembering back to the time when the iPhone launched. Remember when the iPhone came out, and Steve got on stage, and he said, "It's a phone. It's a communications yeah. device. It's a music player, and all you know." But when he did that, he made no mention of apps. In fact, the first iPhone couldn't even run apps. They were pushing this whole idea of web apps back then. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. I was looking at this thing, thinking back to then and how far things have come just a few short years. And now we're here with something that is Photoshop powerful on a mobile device that you can, you know, use anywhere. It just blows me away that you Good can point. do that stuff these days. Yeah, it's just crazy, you know. And it, it also, it, it's also interesting to think, Okay, we're only in 2015. Where are things going to be in a couple years from now when these companies keep iterating and iterating and iterating and making stuff better and refining and all this stuff? We're still at the tip of the iceberg. We're still at like, you know, we, you know, in in evolutionary terms, we just stepped out of the pond, you know, and now things are happening. So, I don't know. It's exciting. Don't you guys get excited? You know, you don't get excited about this stuff. <laughs> I think it's pretty exciting. I'm just it is kind of cool. <laughs> My geek is showing. Sorry, <laughs> your inner geek. Hey, you, know, you know what though? I, but I really appreciate new UI. Uh, like I, I like it when a a, a really yeah, really talented totally. UI designer figures out a way to do something better, yeah. and without without making it so complicated. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Even if it's the same functionality of other apps, mm -hmm. they just change the UI. And I just bought it by the way, and it's it's a nice app. So good yeah. one. Yeah, you got to dig into it. Check out the tutorials that they have built into there. It's kind of cool. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, before we sign off, I want to find out what you guys have coming up. Uh, Andy, I'm going to let you go first. You've been, you haven't been on since, like I said, the beginning of time. What's uh, <sighs> what's coming up in your schedule? Man, uh, so I leave for India uh, on Friday, and hmm. I'm going to lead a tiger safari, but I'm also going to the Taj Mahal on a full moon night, which is kind of cool. And I uh, get back. I'm taking four months off. Yay, four months off. So uh, four months from travel, not four months from working. But um, I am going to do a little family trip in California. Then I'm doing primate shooting in Uganda, Rwanda in September, and then finishing the year in Botswana. Be good. <sighs> it sucks to be you, doesn't it? It is just cool. <sighs> yeah. It is cool. <laughs> So, I mean, if people are like, yeah, I want to go to India, I want to see the Taj Mahal, I want to see gorillas in Rwanda, how do they get on those? Are they all booked <laughs> up, or do they, is it a waiting list, or what? Yeah, for the rest of the year, it mostly is booked up, but I'm starting to plan next year. But just check my website. It's www.andybigs.com. I'm always updating it. Yeah. Awesome. And I've for got these cancellations guys, all the time, too. But say that again? I've got cancellations frequently, so, you know, oh. sometimes things open up. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. AndyBigs.com. And I would guess on the next the next adventure you go on, uh, or now maybe not this next one, but the next one after that one, you'll have your drone with you, right? Probably not to India, but you know, I'll I'll have it uh, I'll have it playing around the summer. That's for sure. The question yeah. is, can I keep my six and nine year old boys away from it? <laughs> Probably not. You might you might want to go invest in a Vision Two for them to learn. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Cool. All right, let's move on before Comcast cuts us off here. Uh, Brian Caparici, what do you have coming up? Frederick, why do you keep putting me like after Andy? He has all these exciting <laughs> things. <and> I, <laughs> I, I am not going on these amazing trips around <laughs> <laughs> Um <laughs> So uh, as a wedding and portrait shooter, it is uh, getting into wedding season for us. So that's going to keep me pretty busy for the next little while. But also um, on the business end, so, you know, I said, said earlier, I teach the business of photography, and we also have um, a software called Sprout Studio for photographers, which basically helps photographers manage their business and do invoicing and clients and galleries and uh, album proofing and everything that, that is required to actually make a living as a wedding and portrait shooter. So we just moved into our offices. So for those watching that have seen me on the show before, the office here is a little bit new for me, and I'm still getting used to it because um, we had to get all under the same roof in order to function as a team. So 
that's sort of new for me, but we're just getting out with uh, our beta for Sprout Studio, so um, that's keeping us pretty busy. Cool. I mean, so can, 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 the, can the TWIP listeners go sign up for the beta and play totally, around? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you go to uh, www.getsproutstudio.com, you'll be able to find out more information about that. But, you know, just as a quick side note, uh, Andy mentioned the idea of, of UI and improving UI and that whole thing. I mean, let me tell you, that's been the world I've been living in for the last few months. Um, and gosh, is it ever exciting. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's really cool to take a problem or take take a, a, a challenge or something that you want to improve upon and really start to drill it down to the deepest level to figure out why something works the way that it does. And really that's ultimately what UI is about, is, is really figuring out how you can take a powerful feature and make it as simple as possible. Um, and that's the world we've been living in, so I have a huge appreciation for that as well, Andy. And I think that's an exciting world that we're going into with what we can do with UI and UX these days. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's crazy. I'm I'm excited because I'm just a, you know, I'm I'm a selfish user on all this stuff, and it's uh, it's fun to have folks like you, Brian, in your company, innovating and thinking of new and exciting and more streamlined ways for me to use the software and get the job done. So kudos and hats off. I can't imagine the stress that goes into doing something like that. <laughs> well, it's it's a project, and it's just like you know, it's one of those things that you never know what you're getting into until you open up, you know, you open up the top, and it's just like, oh my gosh, it's such a a huge project, but it's so exciting to really be diving so deep into something that yeah. I'm personally so passionate and uh, and will use to such a deep extent in my own business. So that's really exciting, you know, to to have. For anyone that's ever been involved in software development or really product development in any uh, area, to have an idea and then all of a sudden have it there in front of you, whether it's a physical product or a piece of software or whatever, uh, it's really rewarding and really fulfilling. So that's been that's been really exciting for me. Cool. Love it, love it. Kudos and hats off. I love it. Thank I you. Love it. And you're also just be before we move off of you, you are also hosting another show on the Twip Network, right? Uh, tell me, yeah, tell so, us a little bit about that uh, show. So, so you've probably gotten the sense, um, obviously, in the discussions here, that I am a wedding photographer. So Twip Weddings, we're on episode number nine as of airing this episode here, mm -hmm. uh, episode four ten of Twip and episode nine of Twip Weddings. We're the baby in the family, but <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, we're, I'm on the show with Bruce Clark um, and uh, Robert Evans who's a celebrity wedding photographer, and uh, love the conversations we have. We're really just diving deep into every part of a wedding. We've talked about post-processing, shooting. We've talked about gear. We've talked about business. We've talked about albums. We've really gone into a lot of really good discussions, and um, it's a really specialized area for a podcast, but our listeners are loving it, and we're loving having the conversations. So, Frederick, thank you for providing the platform for us to do that in uh, under the hey. umbrella. You're welcome. You are you are very welcome. You know, the Twip itself, um, you know, a while ago, I guess, grew beyond the uh, the confines of me being able to do the different verticals effectively. You know, so mm -hmm. the smart thing for me to do was to bring smart people in each vertical on to to address those. So, you guys, so kudo, hats off to you guys for doing that and making the whole network look much better than it would. Ordinarily. So. <laughs> well, we're having a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Um, we're at the end of the show here. I mean, this is a. Uh, I hate it when I hate it when the show's in. I want to thank both of you guys for coming on. It's been a ton of fun. We talked about you know Lightroom CC slash six. We talked about uh, the new iterations of the iPhone camera and what that might mean and all kinds of stuff. Even Andy's new object of his desire, that DJI <laughs> Phantom 3. <laughs> yeah. So, great show, guys. Uh, huge thanks to our sponsors, Animoto, FreshBooks, and Panasonic for making the TWIP network possible. And with that, guys, you can make sure you check out our website over at thisweekinphoto.com. With that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs> <laughs>